Hi, everybody. Uh, if you would like to take a seat, please do. Uh, if you don't want to take a seat, please stand at the back. No problem at all. Uh, great to see you all. Thank you for coming along to our State of the Nation 2024 event. Uh, I'm Gavin, I'm the Global Chief Customer and Revenue Officer at VIEW, uh, and uh, I have great pleasure in welcoming you all today to Hamburg. Thank you for coming from wherever you've come from today. As I said, it's hugely appreciated. Um, this is the fifth year we've compiled the State of the Nation research. It's a great piece of qualitative and quantitative research. So we ask about a thousand by-side individuals around the world what they're thinking about the outdoor market and of course digital and programmatic market. And we use that data to then go around the world and run sessions like this, just to get you immersed in what we're seeing and importantly to discuss what we're seeing. Um, we also have a, a qualitative element where we ask a few uh, agency individuals a bit about what they're seeing. Uh, and we're gonna show you some of the German findings today, okay? Uh, great news is we're joined by a couple of uh, fantastic sets of panels. Uh, the first is a buy-side panel, which Helen, our CMO, will chair. So thank you for those that are uh, partaking in that. And then I'm going to run a supply-side panel with some fantastic media owners. Again, thank you for joining us today for that. Uh, we're not expecting a fire alarm. If you do hear one, please exit. The fire exits are at the back or at the front here. I'm not sure where they go, by the way, but I'm sure they go somewhere safe. Well, I might go that way if there's a fire. So, um, so as I said, yeah, fifth year we've done this. Uh, key markets for us, we research are Germany, the UK, uh, US, Australia, France, and we ran a guest market of Brazil this year. So you might see some global references uh, where we try and benchmark the German statistics <laughs> alongside these other countries. But um, yeah, hopefully it's valuable for you. And hopefully, as I said, you can get some real insight into how progressive this channel really is. It really is moving at a fast rate. It's becoming super exciting. And obviously every year we see really, really interesting statistics. Uh, before Helen or myself uh, run panels, I'd like to welcome on stage Adam. Adam is our Senior Insights and Measurement Manager. He's been with VIEW for over a year, and Adam is heavily involved in this research and what this says. So just before we start the panels, Adam's just going to walk you through a couple of headlines from the German data, and that will hopefully set the tone for the uh, sessions Helen and myself run. Okay, should be about an hour and a half today. Hope that's okay for everyone's timelines. We'll have some time at the end for some questions. We do have a Slido uh, functionality which will be on screen in a little bit. Please log on, add any questions, and at the end I will host some questions and try and get some feedback from you as well for either myself, the VIEW team, or of course any of our panellists today. All right? Uh, other than that, have a great day. Thank you again for coming along, and I'll hand you over to Adam. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? So, my name's Adam. I'm, as Gavin said, the Senior Insights and Research Manager at VIEW. And together with Helen, our CMO, we are largely responsible for pulling together the State of the Nation research. In the next sort of 10 or 15 minutes or so, I'm really hoping to achieve uh, two things. Number one, I'm going to explain a little bit about how the research works, the group of people who have responded to our survey that we push out in Germany. But also I'm gonna try and set the scene for the panels that Gavin and Helen are going to host by very quickly running through some key insights in terms of the, the data, just to give you an idea of what we're gonna be talking about. One sort of quick point of research housekeeping as it were, when we have a look at the data later on, you will see that some of the percentages and statistics that you're going to see add up to more than 100%. And the reason for that is when we filled the questionnaire that people respond to, a lot of the questions you will be able to select more than one response. So, for example, if we asked 
uh, what are the recognised benefits of programmatic out of home within Germany, and we gave people a list of 10, say, you could have picked one from that list, you could have picked three from that list, you could have picked seven from that list, for example. I would also encourage you to use the Slido link as much as possible to submit your questions. So the research itself, uh, as Gavin said, it's fielded in five, mar um, six markets, excuse me, including our guest market for this year, Brazil, with the core markets being the UK, France, Germany, uh, the USA, and Australia. You may see in some of the data today that we have a core market statistics, which will include Brazil, because Brazil is one of the markets that we've looked at this year. But for example, if you see any year-on-year -year statistics, it excludes Brazil because we have no data from Brazil last year because we didn't run the research there. The important thing to say is that each of these markets has its own market highlights, generally 13 to 15 pages long, which you'll see in the little pack that was on many of your seats and can be downloaded from the QR code. There is also a global report which looks at all of the markets together and it looks at programmatic out of home trends on a global level. And the reports themselves are very much designed so that you read your local market report in addition to the global report also to place what you've read for your German market in a little bit of global context also. And I fully expect every single one of you to read absolutely every single page of the report tonight as soon as you get on the train on the way home. <laughs> so, one of the things that's really important to understand about the State of the Nation research is the people who are answering the questionnaire, those 200 Germans, as it were, that are answering the questionnaire have very specific job roles. And this is the very researchy definition of those people. But they are joint or sole decision makers. And if you take the time to read all of this, you'll see that essentially they have interacted in some way, place planned or bought programmatic out of home in the last 12 months. They're digital buyers or they are perhaps planning to interact with programmatic out of home in the next 12 months also. What's really important to understand about this audience is that they are decision-making professionals. We don't ask the kind of industry in general, as it were. We very much make an effort to select 200 people who have the strategic responsibility to be able to make change within the programmatic out-of-home industry, as it were. And if you look at the pie chart on the left here, you can see that 78% of your audience who responded to our questionnaire this year in Germany were of executive director level, with a further 13% of that audience being of the board director level. So you're talking about quite a specific group of people, but at the same time, they have the highest degree of strategic oversight, as it were, when it comes to programmatic out of home. And those are the people who are answering the questions that we are asking them to. And we're going to talk about some of the insights from uh, briefly in a few minutes' time. So one of the reasons State of the Nation is so great, and this is the last slide I'll talk about before we get on to the actual statistics themselves, is it really makes an effort to ask the audience two types of questions. A lot of the questions will ask about a behavior, for example. What have you been doing within programmatic out of home in the last 12 to 18 months? How have you been transacting? Have you been using DCO, your attitude towards sustainability, et cetera, et cetera? But we also make an effort to ask people about what they would like to be doing in the next 12 months with an idea of unearthing their attitudes and preferences for programmatic out of home within Germany. And as a researcher, I think that when you couple this idea of someone's behavior, what have you been doing, alongside their attitude 
towards the next 12 months. Really, in between those two ideas, you have the insight, you have behavior, you have attitude. And I think if you're all able in the next you know, hour and 20 minutes or so to look at the data and listen to the conversations that we're gonna have with a critical ear, because some of the data that you may see may be exactly what you expect. It also, in many respects, may be a little surprising to some of you, I don't know. But I think that process of critical analysis will perhaps help you understand where the opportunity could be for each of your own businesses when you leave here today and, again, hopefully read the report in real detail. So that's the last thing I'm going to say, but I'm just going to quickly run through a few key insights before I hand over to Helen for the uh, first panel. And all of these uh, insights are going to be talked about um, by our panellists and by Helen also. But again, I would encourage you to use the Slido link if you do have more questions, and I will be around at the end if anyone wants to speak about them. So, uh, over the past 18 months, an average of 25% of campaigns have uh, incorporated programmatic out of home in Germany, um, in Germany, and that is expected to rise to around 33% in the next 18 months. When it comes to if the budget for programmatic out of home is going to be increased, where is that budget coming from? We can see that there are many different sources of budget in terms of digital and traditional channels, but also when it comes to new budget also, there, are, there is a plan to have new budgets allocated towards programmatic out of home with the media agencies slightly pipping the advertisers in that respect. Consequently, German marketers are forecasting an average 24% increase in programmatic out of home spend to support that continued adoption. When it comes to who has been responsible for the planning and buying a programmatic digital out of home. This will be unpacked in some detail later on, but the real big winner this year in terms of year-on-year -year change shown here in the little blue diamonds was the DSPs in terms of the DSP managed service. In the past 12 months, um, people have bought their programmatic digital out of home in a variety of ways with programmatic out-of-home only buyers uh, experiencing the greatest lift here at 15% in the middle. When it comes to the recognised benefits of programmatic out-of-home, uh, brand safety features strongly, which was uh, a little above the global average with the enhanced targeting and dynamic creative capabilities of programmatic out-of-home and closely behind. And then perhaps my favourite statistic of all, German, 97% of German marketers are considering testing or actively integrating DCO, dynamic creative optimization, into their campaigns. However, only 8% of German marketers are currently actively using dynamic creative optimization. And naturally, it's an interesting discussion as to why the difference in those two numbers. So, that's all I'm gonna say for now. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to Helen for the first of our panel. And we'll move on from there. Um, thank you very much, Adam. Um, appreciate that. And, and as he said, you know, we've got uh, a panel of esteemed industry experts uh, to discuss some of these findings. So if I can have Matisse, Jonas and Sven, please, up on stage, um, come take your seats um, and we'll get started in any order, um, as you wish. <clears throat> Great. Okay. So um, maybe we can just start with each of you doing a quick introduction about your role, um, you know, uh, and, and your name. Hi, everybody. So my name is Jonas. I've been working in the digital industry like for more than 10 years now. 
uh, currently as a managing director at Weisha JVB. So it's a special agency and um, for our home as well as um, a special unit for retail media. I used to work quite a while for Valdeco. So um, I'm very familiar with out of home at all. Uh, and, and I used to work for Amazon Ads, um, heading the sales team for Nanantex. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Mattes. I'm working for Media Plus Real Time as a unit director and I'm in charge for our omnichannel consulting business. So Digital Out of Home is just one part of the ecosystem we are working for and I'm happy to be here. Hi, my name is Sven. Um, I had my 20 year work anniversary uh, like uh, in the beginning of October, 20 years of digital marketing now, uh, co-founded, oh, thank you. Uh, I co-founded a company called Yaduda back in 2009, and uh, 2013 we launched our DSP Splicky, and since 2018 we've been working programmatic out of home, and uh, have been part of that right now for a while. Thanks. Uh, Sven and I actually had a really interesting conversation um, at lunch about the changes that we've seen as you know, perhaps on the more mature end of our, our careers um, over, the, over the past sort of 20, 25 years. So, um, you know, I think we have a lot of expertise. Um, you know, we've all seen changes in our, in our working life um, on programmatic um, in other channels and now um, in this channel as well. So thank you so much again for being here. Um, one of the things that Adam touched on was brand safety. Um, and you know, this was, was uh, cited by 64% of the respondents as actually being a real key benefit. So it's great that they're recognizing that for, for programmatic digital out of home. But maybe, Jonas, you can start from the buy side. Is this something that your clients are really talking about? I mean, is it still something that needs to be articulated? Uh, yes, absolutely. So it'll it depends on the clients itself. So some clients are more interested in like quantity and others are more interested in quality. So it's, it varies from client to client. But actually when it comes to like contact-based planning, instead of like touch point planning, brand safety is one of the key, key factors for planning. Okay, and Matisse, you mentioned that um, you obviously have a, an omni-channel perspective. Um, and again, is that something that is particularly interesting uh, in your discussions for, for programmatic and digital out of home in general versus some of the other channels? Mm, I guess it's an overall question because our clients are always looking for each channel, which publisher, which inventory, which data, what is the single touch point where we can run the ads. So I guess some of them are more careful and some of them like what Jonas have said are more focused on pricing stuff and stuff like that. So I guess that's more like a, I would say, a German attitude that they want to know, hey, where will the ad be placed? Which touch point is it? What about their recognition for my brand and for the brand suitability at the end of the day? Great, and Sven, do you think it is just a German thing? Because obviously this was higher versus the global average of 59%. So is it a very German specific uh, concern? Yeah, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm, I'm channeling my, my inner psychologist about this. I guess you all have heard the term German angst. Germans do not like to fail that much. Yeah, So failing to learn is not a very German thing. So in the end of the day, to not fail, we try to be really detail-oriented and to have control about things. And obviously, brand safety is something around controlling the environment. And uh, in out of home, it's a lot easier to do this than in other media channels. And I think like the German agencies as well as clients are used to like a high standard or a high level of quality in the German of home market. So that's one of the factors why it's so important made yeah. in Germany. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, I think one of the other aspects that we touched on was um, this idea that you know, if you are bringing new budgets um, into digital out of home for programmatic, um, you know, that that helps the channel grow obviously we're all we're all here for business we're all here to try and um get more money i think um into into this channel um but it's really interesting that there was quite a big difference between media agencies and advertisers actually um understanding and, and what do you think is at play here and maybe we can start with you Jonas. and well i think there are like two main factors three main factors um how to grow like the programmatic business in germany um, first one is like using the flexibility, which is, well, 
it depends on the on the publisher, but um, usually you can be more flexible in terms of planning and strategy. Second is like data enrichment. So the agencies are able to use their data or maybe the client's data. And third, it's like all about automation. So I think this is one of the main topics. So we are working currently from the agency side on a pre bid service to like use a targeting solution. Um, and I think these three factors are one of the most important ones. Okay. Thank you. Um, Matisse, any thoughts on this? Um, I guess the main fact why the budgets are more raised up from the agency perspective than the advertiser perspective will be that, especially for the digital out of home market, it's like a feeling that every single week there are new data providers, new publishers, new inventory. So it's a complexity to have a look on it, what kind of inventory, what kind of data are they provided. And some of the clients are just a little bit afraid, I would say, if we are talking in general about programmatic display and all the other stuff. So for the out of home aspect, there's also they don't have the capacity and time to get in deep dive and deep know how, what type of inventory, what type of placements, um, what will it do for my brand and how can I make a, yeah, a holistic strategy for the whole campaign about all the different touch points for now. Thank you. And Sven, do you think that that sort of um, knowledge and expertise is what's behind the DSPs, um, seeing this, this huge increase year on year in use of DSPs managed service, or is it different uh, factors at play here? I mean, <clears throat> in general, actually, I think there's a lot of market research now out there that programmatic is, is growing in the media type out of home in general. This has some reasons because there's, like you said, flexibility that is at play. You have a lot of data sources that do actually make the media appealing and lets salespeople tell stories to the customers in the end of the day. So there's a lot of fantasy. The other thing is basically programmatic execution is already around for a long time in other media types. And basically the more familiar the teams in agencies become with buying programmatic out of home, the more also the multi-channel piece comes into play. And then some budgets do open up for out of home that recently might have not been considered to be for out of home in general. Thank you. And, um, you know, as DSPs, and I'll, I'll start with you, um, as DSPs are, you know, forecast to be playing a bigger role, um, what do you think there might be, but might be in terms of any challenges or opportunities? Yeah, challenges and opportunities are close connected usually. So in the end of the day, uh, each challenge opposes also an opportunity. For us, definitely multi-channel is something that we do believe is important. Personally, I have the history of being a one media DSP back in 2013, mobile only, and that has totally changed. There's no mobile only DSP anymore. So in the end of the day, multi-channel definitely a thing. If you look at out of form, there is to a certain extent a bit um, a stretch sometimes for DSP between being a planning tool and a media activation tool. To do a planning, an out of home planning, in a traditional way is not the same as working in a DSP. So that's definitely something that's sometimes a challenge for us because depending on who you talk to on agency level or on customer level, the expectations what a DSP should be are very different. And then basically also the trends within out of home to maybe activate even analog out of home. Also, I'm kind of bullish on new inventories that will be coming up, uh, like moving screens where you then have to take real time GPS coordinates of the screens in order to basically make a decent execution. So lots of uh, kind of challenges, but also a lot of opportunity where I'm optimistic that we will continue to grow. Okay, and, and Matisse, you know, from the agency side, where, you know, is there tension there? What are you, what are you finding in terms of your experience and the value that you can bring? Mm, I guess one big benefit is that also the DSP have started integration for the planning process because they took an insight from the bid stream and from the SSP side what we know about the inventory within the bid request. So when we are adding the data aspect in the DSP, we don't have this mismatch between data information regarding the digital out of home um, placement. So for us, it's more, it's an easy way to take a look what type of touch points will fit the best to the audience. And we don't have to 
plan it on two um, different ways to plan just on the audience data focus and then on the out of home placement focus and then mix it together when the campaign is running. So we can also um, make the adjustments for the data perspective when we are already planning the campaign and that's I guess a very big helpful insight and tool. Cool. Jonas, anything to add? I mean, 69% still using uh, specialist out of home agencies. Anything you want to add? This is your, this is your pitch. <laughs> Well, it's, <clears throat> it's a high expertise in these kind of specialized agencies. So, and like, I know it was like 47% DSP managed service. So, which is, I think it's quite high. Mm -hmm. So, and usually it might be done from the agencies itself. If it's uh, based on the multi-channel approach or a single, single channel approach. So, I think it's a, you need, you need a high expertise in out of home in general because, well, programmatic out of home is not display and it's not social, so it makes sense that you have like specialists mm -hmm. like, on the agency side. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're gonna move on um, to dynamic creative. Um, Adam touched on this huge disparity that we're seeing between interest and actual activation. Um, so what do you think, we'll start with um, maybe Sven, what you think is actually driving the level of interest and then maybe you know, some of the reasons why it's actually the uptake is not so high. Yeah, from a DSP perspective, it's actually a pretty good pitch because you can say, well, if you do want to actually use real-time data in order to activate a campaign, then basically also adapting the creative based on uh, the curtain, certain circumstances or the place that you are makes total sense to every customer and agency. So it's, it's an easy pitch to do. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of interest, that's definitely one of the, well, maybe the dominant topic right now in the market when we talk to customers and, and do education sessions. Why it's not upticking yet? A oh, multitude of things, I would say. Uh, one being, I mean, a lot of, especially the larger advertisers rely usually on creative agencies. And the creative agencies are not yet, I would say, fully capable of embracing the DCO challenge in uh, out of home. Uh, so we are kind of still at the point where sometimes the creative is so expensive that in the end of the day, then very often the customer says, well, let's uh, just run a regular campaign. Another reason being, I have to say, is a bit the sell side quite honestly, because usually you will not be able to run one national DCO campaign with just one creative, because the tech stack of the players is so different. And sometimes also it's different goal to get the information what player is actually capable of displaying a DCO at in a proper manner and not going to rely on a fallback. And that is a question that you get asked a lot, especially by experienced buyers. And all of these factors tend to make it still a bit more difficult and why we do have this big gap between need or want and basically the execution, I would say. Well, I'm sure that the, the next panel will probably have something to say on that. So we'll give them the opportunity to reply. Um, Matisse, you know, if you've had any clients um, actually running this or, you know, talking about this, what are the outcomes that they're expecting if they were to use or hoping to achieve if they were to include dynamic creative in their campaigns? Mm, for the moment, it's quite difficult what the really outcome is because most of them just want to show some variety of the products or about their storytelling approach from the campaign. And at the end of the day, if their um, brand recognition is raised up, has to be measured with a different market research additional. So I guess for the moment, it's to use the technical approach to get creatives more individual based in a mass medium like out of home. And some of them are, are very one step ahead when we are talking about the technical stuff with the creative agency and how the assets will be provided and what type of change that will be. And some others are more like, okay, but I can really measure the outcome when I'm using a DCO campaign. So maybe we let's just run with two, three creatives we already have set up in general. And Jonas, you mentioned you do some work in the retail media space. Um, you know, what do you think the opportunities are specifically in that environment? Because everywhere we seem to be going, retail media is like the hot thing this year. Yeah, well, that, well there are quite a big number of new players in the market, like coming from the retail side. 
even if it's like e-commerce or like traditional retailers. And they well, from my point of view or from the agency point of view, it's good for the, the out of home branch itself because like it makes more relevant for more buyers or more clients. So it's like I think it's good. But like for from the publisher of point of view, the market is like even growing and uh, it's getting bigger and bigger and the agencies need to decide which channel or which publisher they want to use. So it's like more complexity at all. Um, and maybe related to DCAO, I'm, I fully agree with Sven. Um, it's like a challenge to integrate DCAO in the, in the tactical or strategic planning because like there are quite a bigger number of stakeholders then you need to talk to the uh, media agency, of course, to the creative agency and the client itself. So that makes it more complex. And um, second, um, there used to be uh, a lack of standards. So Vue was one of the first SSPs uh, providing HTML5. So that's great. Uh, so Thanks um, for the plug. <laughs> um, and it seems like that other publishers and other um, SSPs are doing the, the same step now. So it makes it more, it makes it more easy like to, to scale the whole um, infrastructure. Thank you. Okay, so I think we'll just have one last question. Um, and as, as you know, please do, if you have more questions or something that you really want answered, um, pop it onto Slido um, and we'll address those after the second panel. Um, but what else, you know, do you think that this market needs to do to increase spend in programmatic digital out of home? I'm going to start with you, Jonas. Put you on the spot. Um, three things. I think it's first, education. That's always a, a hot topic. Uh, second, um, automation. And third, it's useful like to have a multi-channel approach and programmatic out of home is like one part of this fully funnel approach. Great, thank you. Matisse, if you get, uh, three different ones if you can. And sorry, Sven, you're like on the end. So <laughs> we're giving you the most time to think about this, but it's the hardest job. Mm, first thing I would say is better understanding how the touch points are working. So more like you said, already more on an education stuff. Um, second thing will be standardization that we can have access to the different points on an omnichannel perspective. And I guess the, the last one is um, to be more brave about what we have done and we can reach and be more, um, more risky, try things out and don't be yeah, avoiding some new topics. Thank you, Sven. Where yeah, they stole you? most of my points <laughs> already. <laughs> But at least that one, I would say, I think on par pricing is still a point. Um, we do see still in some of the markets that we do interact that programmatic tends to be more expensive than a classical I.O. booking. And that is definitely a point that's holding back some advertisers. If the pa pricing would be on par, then basically I think we would be seeing more spend in that area already. So that's definitely one that I would like to add. I'm going to ask you a follow-up question on that. And sorry, because it's not prepped. Um, but do you think that means that they're not seeing the value that you they could get with the additional data, flexibility, all of those things that you're driving in programmatic? Uh, you're getting back the to the education piece to a certain extent. Because also sometimes we do see that basically it's either or. Do I run that campaign why I or do I run it programmatically? While I'm thinking very often it would be intelligent to run it both, to have a, like an I.O. based booking that is basically the default and then add a programmatic element and have a certain percentage of the overall budget spent on this kind of campaign. So this stems back to education. But again, then we are with measurements. Uh, I talked with Gavin about this a little bit and we still have a hard time to, to measure the success and the outcome of out of form advertising, uh, depending, especially when you have a very performance driven advertisers, that's hard to, to evaluate. So they look at the cost. And if basically the cost for programmatic is in total and 20% higher than basically an average IO booking, then basically I'm very often going to tend to say, oh, well, let's do IO because this seems to be the better deal. 
Okay, thank you. Well, I think that's a really interesting um, insight to, to end on. Um, certainly, we, we do see often that sort of hybrid approach being the first ways that uh, people get into programmatic. Um, and so, obviously, for, from our perspective, we always encourage, encourage that test and learn approach, see what results you get. Um, and, and I think that is you know, the way forward. It's not an either or necessarily, um, but it's an evolution. And, and hopefully over time, they see the benefits that you can get through the you know, use of data, the increased flexibility, all of those, all of those aspects. But um, thank you so much for your time today. I think um, let's please give them a round of applause. Um, OK, and so I will hand over to Gavin now. Thank you, Helen. Thank you to the panelists. Great uh, debate there. Um, sorry, just uh, da -da -da -da. thank you. My technical skills are lacking. Um, some really interesting points there, actually. Uh, very, very interesting uh, points on DCO. Um, very interesting multi-channel points. Um, Mattis's point there about being brave, I think, stuck quite quite loudly in my in my mind. You know, how do we all become a bit braver? Um, and what does that look like? So really interesting, so thank you. And please, there is two questions on Slido. Thank you, Helen. Uh, please do add more uh, so that we can ask the really kind of maybe deeper questions or more controversial questions as well. Right, we now have a supply side panel. So uh, tr try and get a rounded kind of perspective on what you've heard so far and obviously linked to the data. So can I welcome on stage, please, Felix, Paul and Dorota. Welcome, guys. Thank you. I know most people probably know you. Um, maybe some people don't. I don't know. But maybe you could introduce yourself. We'll start uh, at the end, Dorota, please. Hi. Um, I'm Dorota. I'm head of programmatic at Valdico. Um, and uh, I'm also responsible for developing programmatic strategy for JCDCO. Welcome. Thank you. Paul? My name is Paul. I'm in charge for the internationalization at Framen. So uh, Framen is active in 31 countries, so we got a lot to do there. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Felix. I work for Media Frankfurt. We are the largest marketer of airport inventory in the Dach region. And um, since we started our programmatic journey two and a half years ago, I take care of selling our inventory and the inventory of our partner airports programmatically. Fantastic, thank you. Three brilliant media owners, very different inventory. So why don't we start with that sort of question, and Felix, maybe you first. Um, what, is the, what has been the opportunity and maybe challenge this year, if you could just summarize maybe for the audience from your perspective, so from a programmatic angle as well, please. So for us, I would say the data topic has been the biggest challenge. So not only from the point of view to gather data to this quite unique environment that we have um, because we cannot just transfer the data that we have in or that you find in street to an airport one-to-one -one because for example you cannot use um, uh, geo data um, as good you cannot use lat longs as good because we're working in an environment with four levels you could have the same lat long on level four where you have departures to non schengen or have the same lat long on level three where you have arrivals from Schengen, so a completely different target group. So we kind of have to come up with our own data solutions. Um, this is one part of the challenge, but the larger part of the challenge, I would say, is to get this data and then to shape it in a way that we can use it automated, that we can use it as a really thresh low threshold service to our clients and to make it accessible in an easy way, I would say. So that is, um, we've done quite a lot of work this year and I think that is the biggest opportunity for us that we have um, in the next year. Yep, I agree. I think most people in the room will say data is the opportunity. Easy one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. where do we start on that one? Uh, Dorota, any challenges or opportunities you can share this year? Of course. Please go for it. Um, I, th I think we are in a very interesting moment at Valdico, uh, and I think at the JCDCO as well. 
uh, five years already with programmatic, which is a moment of, I would call, growing pains. We are not mentally a startup and building something new and trying to convince you it's great or building it together because all of you are, are part of this exciting journey, but we are more into scaling, which means how can we be better at delivering ads, answering your needs, having better products in the DSPs, on the SSP, etc. But I think also important for you to mention, we are a huge organization and we have been created in a way to have a separate programmatic team and at the end of the row there is part of our traditional team. So we are, we, our one of the biggest challenges is how do we transform the organization so everyone within JCD Co can sell programmatic and become part of it, how we enable, in, enable it within, within the organization. Such an interesting point from a media owner perspective because you have huge successful direct businesses that will remain and it's how do you capitalize on programmatic alongside that I think isn't it so it's a really yes good point. yes you're right and I think essentially you are guys experts in programmatic right so you want to buy through the DSP but not everyone outside on the street wants to buy through the DSP so our goal is to be able to give digital out of home and out of home to whoever likes it in whichever way they choose. So it doesn't matter. But I think programmatic is a little bit different product for the company. So we need to make sure that everyone understands how everything works, including programmatic experts understanding how digital out of home works or paper works. Yeah, and it links to the panel before. Education is never going to go away. I think Jonas mentioned it. It's just what are we educating to whom and what does that look like? We're always going to be you know, trying to get people to embrace or adopt or listen or learn, and it's difficult. So. True, but at least we all speak one language, right? Correct. However, we still cannot agree on one acronym. I think I want to have a poll at the end. How should we call it? <laughs> PR do, and I will not say the other ones. <laughs> we'll stick to the safer ones. Uh, Paul, Freeman, challenge, opportunity from 2024, or both? Both. <laughs> Go for it. I mean, I think 2024 was a challenging year for everyone in this room. However, um, for us, since we are a full C CMS provider in first place, and uh, we um, onboarding our locations, not only by just giving them um, a media where you can place ads. Uh, for us, there were a lot of challenges around entertainment uh, in other countries. So as we started our new markets, Italy and Spain, for example, we needed to find uh, uh, content partners for us. So news, uh, we needed to translate uh, our fitness news that we have in Germany plugged in. So we need to, way, to find a way to uh, place them in other countries. So that was kind of challenging. I know not very relevant for programmatic in first place because to be very honest, we, we are pretty much straightforward when it comes to programmatic. So as soon as we have screens connected, the screen is ready to, to be sold programmatically. So there is no challenge. The challenge is getting the relevant reach in countries. So when we start, we need to build up our network pretty much quickly because below 500 screens, nobody takes you seriously. This is what we have learned in Germany the hard way. Um, and now we need to scale up quickly with uh, opening new markets. And opening new markets is our opportunity for the next years because we see that internationalization is becoming the next big thing in programmatic. So what we have experienced is that there's a lot of advertisers buying multiple countries through one DSP. So this is a huge opportunity for us where we're going to invest further. Great to hear. Thank you. Yeah, agreed. Multi-market, um, um, you know, international budgets. I think these are really relevant topics that are hitting, hitting our industry. And it's, you know, how do we all capitalize on that? And, and especially on that omni-channel piece. Uh, one of the data points that we showcased earlier was about PG, programmatic guaranteed versus non-guaranteed. Uh, I think it's fair to say the German market has very much led the way in programmatic guaranteed. Uh, I've been with the business five years and it's, it's been a very, very kind of primary kind of way to, to buy and trade. I was actually in the US a month ago, I was telling a few people, and ironically, programmatic guaranteed has not really hit the US market yet. Very, very different dynamic, very, very different way of, of trading. Dorota, maybe I could ask you the question. So I think it's 67% of this market is bought in a programmatic guaranteed way. Um, from your perspective, um, why do you think that is the preferred way of buying? And, and will that continue, do you think? 
accept the German angst, uh, which you heard already, right? <laughs> it's very secure, so it answers cultural needs. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, also from when, when we started programmatic, we also encouraged to go through guaranteed because the inventory is finite, right? So we were also the ones as media owners, I speak for Valdicon, not everyone maybe agrees, to encourage to go through guaranteed uh, because it gives you the guarantee you are going to display in specific days or hours, etc. And uh, I think it's also very cultural and very specific. And then we have another aspect, which is managed service. So also the clients in Germany like to have managed service. And I think you had even a statistic in the... Uh, in the um, in the report around that, and it's true. The clients here overall prefer the security and having a guarantee. And let's be honest, the budgets invested in programmatic in Germany are relatively high. So if a client is investing 200, 300, 400k, they want to be sure they are going to deliver whatever is needed. However, interestingly, on a JCD call ever, around 75% of our uh, deals are non-guaranteed deals, right? But we see today much more, uh, much more uh, markets are more interested in guaranteed, also because big clients and agencies, let's imagine TikTok, for example, they prefer to buy guaranteed because they make a commitment to their, you know, to their buyers. So I actually think there maybe in Germany they will go a little bit down the guaranteed, and we are working on it. Uh, we are open to non-guaranteed, of course, as well. I don't want to say we just do no <laughs> guaranteed deals, but I think the other markets are going to embrace guaranteed as well. And just maybe a quick elaboration, if you don't mind. Have you had to adapt in any way to, to kind of almost, you talk a bit about managed service, you talk a bit about non-guaranteed. Do you adapt as a media owner to capitalize on that or what have you done? Of course, whatever our clients want, we will make it work. <laughs> there is no limit. <laughs> No, uh, in, in all fairness, uh, I think, Mark, we had a lot of conversation about, oh, guys, your clients like so much guaranteed. Can you give us more non-guaranteed? And we give always on deals, for example, or we give other deals. So we want the clients to capitalize on non-guaranteed and whatever the client prefers, we are going to give. If they have no DSP or they need support, we support with managed service as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Paul, maybe similar question. Is your inventory changing? Are you adapting the way you package your inventory to demand or just as a business strategy? Is there anything you can share? I kind of agree with uh, Dorotas. When a client reaches a certain level of budget, then programmatic guaranteed is a thing. Then they want the safety. Then they need to be on point with the impressions. And if there is... A little bit more impressions, it's also bad. So, um, yeah, um, non-guaranteed actually is the most frequently asked for deal type that we are receiving. So, um, I would say everything which is below 100K is asking for non-guaranteed. I mean, we're not as established as JCD Co., but um, maybe because we're a little bit new to the market, we kind of need to build up trust and safety. But... After we have built and gained trust with clients, then they want guaranteed business with us. Um, as we started onboarding our first screens uh, on programmatic platforms, we saw that the first demand was non-guaranteed. Larger budgets, briefings, whatever, everything was non-guaranteed in the beginning. Now it kind of shifts to programmatic guaranteed. This is what I can observe as well. But more for larger clients. Yep. So the small clients, in my opinion, are still looking at digital out of form as a niche niche media sometimes. I mean, if we're just talking about a, a company that is spending a lot of money online, on digital, on conversion media, whatever, and now tries to shift to digital out of form the first time, they will not buy programmatic guarantee. They will say, well, here's 20K, I will try digital out of form. Give me something that you can offer me. That's correct. And also, I think even big clients like to have non-guaranteed deals because certain features of the DSP, a certain data sets are only there. So I, I, I think that's, and we had a buyer panel before, I think it essentially depends on the client, the strategy, what you need, etc. But at the end of the day, yes, it's small. First campaign, usually as a test, will be non-guaranteed and the growth goes to guaranteed, and also the security and certain elements. But sometimes the DSP has the, the key, most important element for the client, which is either planning 
or, or data. Uh, so it has to be more non-guaranteed, I think, long term. Yep, thank you. Felix, anything to add in terms of your business and strategy and are you adapting or...? Yes, so we um, started with programmatic guarantee just one year ago. So um, we have about one third um, of revenue guaranteed and one thir uh, two thirds of revenue non-guaranteed. So it still has been quite a good success story because just one year and one third of the overall programmatic revenue is quite good, I think. Um, we have mainly two types of clients booking programmatic guaranteed which is either a client um, anticipating scarcity of revenue in a certain period. This could be Q4, of course, but also the European Championship. We only had programmatic guaranteed deals, actually. And the other part of the clients are clients that just want to try programmatic for the first time and therefore go for programmatic guaranteed. And um, what we did, talking about sales strategies, pricing strategies, is basically um, also what you guys already said, that we um, established minimum booking volumes of programmatic guaranteed deals during times of scarce revenue. So during the Euro, you could only buy our revenue with um, campaigns 50K and upwards, um, just to have a better yield management. But apart from that, we are quite open to any budget. So um, this is one thing that has proven re really useful for us. Um, and also regarding the CPM pricing, the more narrow your targeting gets in a guaranteed deal, the higher the CPM will get. So we're trying to avoid very small campaigns blocking big chunks of our, revenue, of our inventory, basically. Yeah, makes sense. Um, maybe an open question to you all, and, and whoever wants to, to input, please do. And we've touched on this a bit, but do we think as we're talking more omnichannel budgets and unlocking those as being the key, do we think non-guaranteed is therefore more likely to be the direction of travel? If you think of the agencies, how they plan the flexibility, how they use other channels, do we expect non-guaranteed to keep growing if we believe that omnichannel budgets are the budgets to unlock, if that makes sense? Who wants to go first? Um, yes, I would definitely agree on this one. Like, um, as I said, the first part of the clients who are looking for securing inventory, they will stay PG, I'm pretty sure, at least for our airport clients. But the other part who are trying programmatic for the first time, who are just like trying out stuff and getting more into non-guaranteed um, uh, deals eventually, these budgets will... Um, um, will shift towards non-guaranteed, so um, I think there will be for definitely for our clients, um, and we can see it for some of them already that they started to book guaranteed and are now more interested in uh, non-guaranteed deals. So um, yes, I think this will be the case. I think the radical difference, obviously, is display. There's more of an infinite inventory. This channel, there is a finite inventory. There is capped, arguably. So I don't know if Paul Dorota, you have any thoughts on that NG direction of travel. I mean, yes, uh, as, a, as a client acquisition strategy, yes, I would definitely uh, offer non-guaranteed as prior first because uh, it will give flexibility, freedom to advertisers who are new to programmatic digital out of form maybe, um, who, are, um, who have not experienced yet programmatic uh, freedom, I would call it. So for all of type of clients like this who want to try digital out of form the first time, we will have always non-guaranteed deals. Um, I mean, yes, there are some, some inventories that we have which are limited and quickly capped. Coworkings, as, ex as an example, is our most sold inventory worldwide. So giving non-guaranteed deals on co-working spaces, I would think twice about it, but we have a lot of inventory where we can offer entry level prices, entry level um, yeah, entry level circumstances for any advertiser that wants to try digital out of home and who have never ever spent a single cent on digital out of home. So bringing fresh cash to the market is something great and that should be in everybody's priority in my opinion if you want to gain new advertisers. I agree. I don't know, to be honest, because I think at the end of the day, 
it will be it's more about open exchange if you want buyers who are buying today mobile and display they would most likely go through open exchange because it's more natural for them open exchange is not widely used within digital out of home industry worldwide there are a couple of exceptions but i think this is the most natural way to shift the the digital mindset or someone who never touched digital out of home to go and it's the the adoption it could be much faster and then i think actually they will anyway go back to pmps which is non guaranteed and guaranteed but to help every single one in the world to access digital out of home that's the easiest way. That's really interesting. Almost a bridging gap to get people more interested and bought in and then perhaps PMP. In other markets, it's interesting you say, we do see a trend where open exchange is declining versus PMP. But as you said, there's only a handful of markets where open exchange really exists. So it's a really interesting point, Dorota. Um, the market share of um, out-of-home in general in H1 this year in Germany was 9.4%. So about 9.5% of all media was being spent in out-of-home, um, and that's up from 8.6% the year before. So about one percentage point gain, which is obviously you know, meaningful when you think about the revenue behind that. Our report showed that 27% of German media agencies are planning to add new money to the channel, which is great, uh, and that's against an average of about 21% globally, uh, and that was touched upon in the buy side panel. Maybe, Felix, if we could start with you, um, how do you try and attract these new investments? So mainly what we do is, on the one hand, we try to get more programmatic inventory. This is basically by, we have um, a total of eight partner airports um, across the DAC region, and one by one will be connected to our programmatic inventory. We have um, Frankfurt, obviously, um, Hamburg, and we will get next year Stuttgart and Cologne. So we're increasing our inventory. This is one important part for us. And um, as I said earlier, the other important part for us is getting and unlocking um, uh, data sources that we have. have we have data sources like um, um, the sales figures of um, duty-free shops um, or to like really make an, um, a flight targeting accurate, like really to use these specialities of this inventory to really be able to have someone who lands from the U.S., being targeted, even if the flight is delayed by half an hour, the campaign will be delayed by half an hour as well. Only take those screens um, that are along the path and at the baggage belt of this specific passenger. So really to improve our offer by improving the data and by improving the automation of the data. Yep. Thank you. Paul, you talked about new budgets and it being important and exciting to everyone. H how are you going about that and how are you trying to unlock that new, new cash? I mean, if you attend any conference or panel in the last eight, nine, 12 months in Germany, the big topic was retail media. Like everyone went crazy about it and everyone talks about it and everyone invests in retail media. And for us, this is definitely a thing to attract new cash for us. So we have launched uh, retail media this year with uh, large partners. And also, we're going to um, build up this network uh, internationally. And um, besides that, of course, we always, uh, we're always looking out for new screens, new markets, new venues. Because venues is, in our opinion, like I have to maybe explain, Freeman is 99% indoor. So we're not talking about out of home, like in the traditional way, like something is next to the street. Framen is 99% uh, indoor. So we open up venue types that have not been before in digital out of home. Co-working spaces, for example. Like three years ago, there were no co-working spaces in digital out of home. So what we do to attract new cash for digital out of home in general is bringing new venue types to the digital out of home environment. And this will still be our priority, whether it's retail media or it's sports or it's, I don't know, stadium advertising, you name it, we will be there. Great, and I agree, new inventory, it's, it's attractive, it's appealing, it gets interest, doesn't it? You know, wh wherever that inventory is, it's, it, 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 it attracts perhaps that, that euro into the market that wasn't there before, so. Yeah, and I mean, to be, to be quite fair, you won't attract me 
on my phone anymore. Like, if you're spending on Instagram, I, I assume you as annoying. You're just inviting my privacy. I'm YouTube premium client. I don't want to see advertising <laughs> inside my for uh, in, in, inside my room. So, um, therefore, I think a lot of people to reach and uh, get them as um, your your fans, you need to invest into out of home and digital out of home, especially. So. Um, yeah, there will be a shift and there will be a huge budget shift in the near future and you uh, need to be there with new inventory. Great, agreed. Uh, Duro, to that 27% of new money coming in, what do you think that says about the German market? Because that's higher than the global average. Do you think it is 27 per Yeah, it's only from Germany, right? It's not Correct. from... Correct. So it's worldwide. 27% of German media agencies are planning to add net new mm. budgets, and the global average is 21. So. Well, I, I hope it would mean that everyone has getting more budgets in general. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think there is uh, also an interesting uh, shift from uh, TV, TV reach dropping. So we also have uh, products where we are filling in the... TV reach gaps with digital out of home, and I think it's also a, a key and an important element which is leading to to that. And of course, the whole industry is is developing widely with products within DSPs. And I think there is a, a, a the adoption will also come from a technological limitations being completely dissolved. So the easier you can buy, the bigger the bigger the the, the growth will be. Yeah, agreed. And I know Sven mentioned the kind of um, topic of price within the channel. I think if you look at the omnichannel pricing, out of home is still incredibly affordable versus some other channels. So again, I think that there is a allure there, there is an attraction there of it's obviously hugely visible, but actually quite cost efficient at the moment. So I think that's that's quite an interesting kind of draw for, for, for buyers and agencies. Um, we talked about dynamic creative a little bit on the panel before and the discrepancy between the intent versus the actual um, sort of delivery or action. I'd like to get a media owner perspective um, from you all, please. Um, what do you think that the industry needs to do to really fix that gap? And maybe a, a linked question is, is, is this the right direction of travel anyway? Is Dynamic Creative a good solution for outdoor? Will it bring net new money in? You know, and if so, how and what needs to be done? Uh, Paul, maybe start with you on this one, please. Um. I'm observing this trend uh, like when, it's, when it was the first time announced that there was a DCO. And I'm honestly, I'm not really sold yet on that trend because it's too easy in my opinion. It's like one fallback creative and then you just exchange the facts like, hey, you can buy this product in this store. Wow. I mean, if you ask me as a media owner, I would deep dive much more on creativity. It's lacking creativity. Like there's no, not a single case that comes to my mind where I would say, wow, this was a very great use, use case for DCO. There was a creative agency behind and they really thought about this is the audience, it's a younger audience or it's the audience in San Pauli. So we will, we will work with uh, some of the famous red light district motifs, something like this, right? right? You know, there's so much possibility, and in the end, you just get car price there. And for my opinion, there needs to be way, 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 way more work done on those creative levels of DCO. And if it's done correctly, I would say yes, you can definitely have a bigger impact with your brand, and then you have really brought an interesting, successful case to digital out of home with DCO, my opinion. I think it's a great opinion. I, th I think I have seen cases around the world where it does work. I've seen, um, you know, um, data linked to Strava, Samsung, people running in an area and how many kilometers these people have covered, you know, jogging that day in the morning and it on, on, on creative. I've seen sports events, real time, um, kind of dynamic uh, results based, but they're really few and far between, and they still feel quite, quite basic still. So I completely get the point. Um, Felix, anything to add from your side in terms of why the discrepancy and is it the right direction of travel? Should we get super excited about this or not? Um, yeah, firstly, I think I am. Uh, I agree with what uh, what Paul said. 
What we also experienced is that we also, we had sometimes really sophisticated, creative briefings with DCO. I mean, you can play a lot with it at the airport with different passengers coming from different locations and so on. But at the end, sometimes it just lagged. And I think we heard that earlier in the first panel as well. Um, and the technological environment that is provided by different players, also where the data comes from, the way the client provides the data. So we had a lot of really nice briefings that we thought, okay, this is going to be a great case that we can show everyone, but that um, ended up not going to happen or not going to happen in the way that it was initially planned. So sometimes it's also just the infrastructure that is um, not um, speaking the same language, I would say. Yeah, agreed. And, and Dorota, from your side, same question, but is there anything that can be implemented as well or anything that can be done better to help facilitate growth around that topic? Um, again, SSP and DSP enabling it in a seamless way. I think on our end, we solved the, the challenge of DCO by having uh, people who are actually doing DCO for our clients, uh, either on a creativity or on technical end, in-house, and I think this has proven to be a, a good strategy. Um, and I and I and I also think that the element of creativity is very important. So I, I fully agree with what you said, and I think actually the creativity and data long term is going to be the biggest biggest trend. But I I would like to point out which I'm missing in your report, and I believe you haven't been uh, scoping it. It's 3D creatives. So. 3D creatives today, I think, are the most interesting driver for brand awareness. And even if today you will go around Hamburg, you will see amazing Gatorade. Gut it's like an energy drink. Yep. Creative, so nice. And I, I don't think we need to copy one-to-one -one digital and take it to, uh, to digital out of home. I think we should be pursuing what we know works in traditional and pushing it towards programmatic. I think that's a really good point. You know, the, the channel is dynamic and different. So let's maintain that dynamism and difference. And if that's 3D creative um, and maybe DCO to a, to a certain level, then why shouldn't we be pushing on further? So do you have any other points, guys, on that topic of what else needs to be uh, some, from a solution point of view could help the industry or should be embedded? Otherwise, we can move on. I don't want to give you the same, the same chance to answer that. Um, yes, so I basically agree with, with uh, what Dorota said um, and um, also what we, like from an airport perspective, what we also need to have is um, like to bring our product to a better connection also with the DSPs, I would say, like to be more, because airport is a special environment compared to street, you're not just looking at a map saying, okay, I take this and this and this. Um, we also need to get all the data transferred through the whole system to the client that it's also bookable in a self-service in a self-service way um, uh, so um, yeah this is a, a big step for us for for this um, specific um, part of programmatic out of home yeah thank you paul anything else tech first like this is our our DNA, our tech team is bigger than our sales team, so I think that's that speaks a language. <laughs> and um, you know, we're always trying to to evolve our product and products. So we're not only talking about digital out of home, but that's a separate topic. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think regarding integrations, regarding making DCO technically uh, possible. There is not an. There should not be any issue for uh, a media owner if they want to survive in the future with their tech. My opinion. Thank you. Um, we're just going to go into the last question now. Please do submit any more questions on Slido if you have any more. There are some great questions on there. But if you do have anything else to any of our panelists today, do please pop them on there. Uh, so the last question, please, was that the initial prediction for 2024 was that programmatic would overtake direct I.O. Um, revenue in Germany. Uh, this hasn't happened. Uh, it's not far off, but it hasn't happened. Um, from a client perspective, uh, how do you see clients continuing to use direct, programmatic, or a hybrid? Um, and is there anything that you want to see more of or that's hindering programmatic 
Um, there's been some good references to both strategies are important, which I think is, is fundamental. But I'd love your opinion on what you're seeing in terms of how the direct to programmatic elements work together. Um, so I don't mind who answers that one first. Yeah, so um, for us, I think the shift or the mind shift, and especially for clients, that um, they are, at the moment they are more like, okay, we take programmatic or we take I.O., what is the better option for this campaign? Um, and we start to see more clients going for a hybrid way. So we had um, one cl uh, fragrance client who sold their products at the airport. They said, okay, I want to have a campaign four weeks, I owe just one slot on this um, uh, deluxe network or whatever. Um, but at the same time saying, I want to have a special targeting towards Chinese passengers. So that was a great approach with great sales um, results, by the way. Um, and I think um, as soon as more of our clients start to understand that it's not either programmatic or I.O., but it can be very complementary to each other. Um, I think this will unleash a lot of um, budget from clients that are typically like advertising around airports. Like these are really coming from a mindset where I want to have a large deluxe billboard or whatever. As soon as this client, uh, mind shift happens, I think there will be much more um, uh, revenue towards um, programmatic airport inventory. Thank you. I think first of all, uh, on, on Valdico and we are very close to get to this number. Uh, maybe some of you know that um, our managing director, Andreas Prasa, communicated like two or three years ago in the media that Valdico has a target 50-50 by 2024, which means we will do 50% of our digital out-of-home revenues with programmatic. And to be honest, we are not there yet, but it's a matter, I think, in my opinion, of maybe approximately one year, one and a half, and it's a couple percentage points uh, which we are missing. Interestingly, on a group level at JCD Co, uh, we are uh, delivering 9% uh, of digital out-of-home revenues worldwide with programmatic. It's a number from the first half year of, of this year and is growing year over year. So I think this statistic you are showing right now, it's very, very unique worldwide. Uh, to digital out of home and programmatic, and there is a, a very specific reason. Not only German market is is very keen on developing programmatic digital out of home, but also in other markets we observe that they offer almost the same product in digital versus in programmatic. And if there there is exactly the same flexibility in digital as in programmatic, of course the clients and agencies will have less interest to go into programmatic. So I think it's something worth to consider. But I do believe, and we have also a, uh, we have a new target, um, <laughs> that, <laughs> that it's going actually to be more programmatic within the next few years. And the programmatic for Valdico and for GCDCO is going to be a very important growth driver. Uh, and also, I think it confirms with you, with with this place, with the investment the group is, is doing into going into this direction. Yep, thank you, Dorota, for the insights. Paul, anything to add? I mean, whoever does the sales uh, reports the revenue. So, <laughs> I mean, if, yes, if, um, if I would be very correct, then all sales that have been done through the frame and sales team would be I.O., but practically, if you purchase a campaign on our own platform, it's 100% programmatically because we also have our own SSP and our own DSP. So the logic behind is 100% programmatic. So I could say, yes, 100% of our revenue is programmatic. But breaking it down uh, into IO business, then uh, we, I would say 75% of our revenue is programmatic and 25% is IO business. It's like really, hey, I want four weeks of this and that, and there's the money, there you go. So, yeah, um, I agree with the number, and we overperformed the number <laughs> from my perspective, but yeah, the trend will go up, I would say, and um, also for for our other partners and uh, partners in out of home, they will also experience uh, a trend that will uh, fire the growth of programmatic. Agreed. Uh, a statistic I said to a few people over lunch, um, and it depends what you read, but the digital, sorry, the outdoor media market is about $40 billion globally, give or take. 
The digital element of that is about $10 billion, so a quarter. And the programmatic element of that is about $1 billion. So 1 40th of all out-of-home spend at the moment globally, roughly, is programmatic. So the potential is huge. That doesn't mean direct is going to disappear because the nature of this channel is that it's highly premium inventory that people want to secure. But the programmatic element obviously still has some headroom, I think, and will continue to grow. Um, we've got some questions. We've got about 10, 15 minutes, I think. So I'll start with the questions for you all on, on the panel, and then we'll maybe ask the buy side some questions as well. So first question from Louis, thank you very much. Uh, towards the publishers, are you currently working towards venue type standardization? We, we are actually, we adapted the open RTB protocol on which defined how, how the venue type should look like and we are passing by the exact open RTB venue type to the DSPs. Are you, are you seeing some discrepancies? That's why you are asking? Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure if everyone heard that, but it's a really valid point. There is still a standardization, I think, needed. And if we're talking about unlocking more, more revenue, you know, standards are good. They are our friend. You know, they will, they will unlock more potential. So it's a really good question. Thank you. Um, there's a question here, which is both for buy and sell side. Um, but I'll ask the panel here at the moment, how much of your programmatic spend is coming from outside of your respective market. So are you getting much money basically from outside of Germany is the question. I'll ask the buy side that question in a minute as well, but I'm curious if you can share anything. I don't know, Bjorn and Michael, do you remember? <laughs> He's thinking, <laughs> they are thinking guys. No? Y there is some, that's for sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to give a view perspective. Oh, so, great. Let's go. So view currently sees about 10% of its global revenue. Bear in mind, we're in 24 markets from outside of the market, the money spent in, if that makes sense. So call it 10% of our global revenue is coming from somewhere else. That could be from Germany to UK or from China to France. Okay. So that's our perspective. I don't know if Paul or Felix, you have any insights you can share. Are you seeing money come from other, other parts of the world? Um, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the tourism, tourism industry is investing a lot. I mean, <laughs> just a fun fact, just right from my shoulder down there, there's like a 400 million luxurious yacht uh, in the docks in the Lusen Werft, which is a German company famous for luxurious yachts. And this belongs to the Emir of Qatar. And yes, those countries from the Middle East are investing a lot of money globally. And also their tourism uh, departments spending a lot of money globally. And China, automotive industry, spending a lot of money. Like, it's, it's crazy what, 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 what we experience out there, where the money is coming from. And also Latin America industry, like tourism industry, we have, I've seen it now, like Cuba is spending a lot of money in Germany at the moment. Like, it's crazy. I mean, I was driving in front of buses and they were like covered with Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. And that's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for this. I'm happy for this, that there's internationalization happening. Um, to give you a percentage from my perspective, oh, it's tough. I would say a little bit more than 10%, obviously, yeah. But I... I, have, I don't have the exact numbers. Yeah, well, we are very used to international revenues at airports, um, so um, we pretty much see a similar, if not more or higher share of international revenue in programmatic. So I would say the programmatic revenue we get from German um, uh, advertisers compared to all the international ones is definitely more than half of it from international side. I don't have the exact number as well, but at least half of it or more. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah, makes sense with your business. Can we ask the same question to the buy side maybe, just to get a perspective? I don't know if anyone that was on the panel 
earlier is able to answer that or anyone that's on the buy side wants to so um like Vajra J4B is mainly driven by domestic um, budgets so it's not that international so well there are some clients who are planning on a european level for instance like unilever or other big companies but it's mainly driven by domestic budgets maybe it's different sven do you have a perspective you could share with the uh, the group Thank you. Um, yeah, well, basically, our focus on markets is very much the German-speaking markets. But having said that, we see basically there is more international spend now coming. Um, also, not only from Germany into the other two smaller markets, but also the other way around. Basically, Swiss businesses investing into the German-speaking markets. It's happening. I wouldn't say it's yet, yeah, well, anything between 5 to 10 percent, yeah. Thank you. Maybe you could keep the microphone for this one, if you don't mind. Um, new budgets from digital channels to digital out of home. And the question is, which is the most promising or where, where is the budget coming from? Is it social? Is it TV? Uh, and why, in your opinion? Yeah, digital. I mean, TV in general, I think, is a channel that <clears throat> Dorota pointed that out. Um, we belong to a very strong TV sales house in Switzerland, so I have to always be careful when talking about TV. But in the end of the day, it's it's still a very successful media, obviously. But um, yeah, you can tell that some audiences are harder to reach nowadays in TV. And that is something that has found the way into the head and planning strategies of agencies and advertisers. So definitely there's some spend coming there. And I think actually what will happen with cookie depreciation and other things in digital might also be beneficial to digital out of form because a lot of the concepts that used to be dominant in digital might not fly as easily as they used to in the past. And this is always a chance to attract some spend from these kind of channels as well. Thank you. Anyone else with an opinion on that from the buy side panel? Don't feel obliged. I know it's not 100% relevant for everybody, but anything there on the what what the budget's coming from elsewhere, an opinion on which channels those budgets might be coming from? Mm, I would say from the agency perspective, we see that some of the budgets are coming from very traditional media channels like TV because regarding the younger audience and all their uh, capability, there is a slow fall, I guess. But... Um, in general, I guess what we have seen around the COVID um, thing was that with digital out of home, we are very smart and have an easy way to activate and deactivate campaigns, and it's more given the flexibility for the agency and the advertisers. Thank you. There's a question here, which is, what is retail media for digital out of home? Um, mall, supermarket, street, question mark. The answer is 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 trying to align channels, I think, more and more. So you do see some big retailers, Tesco in the UK is a great example where they have screens outside their locations. They can track obviously creative and activity then in store. That's bringing an outdoor element to a retail element. You have quite a lot of uh, emerging uh, media owners across Europe where they actually have screens in their shop window as well that are almost facing onto the street. Um, and that sort of is bringing the two channels together. Uh, malls, yes, that is a very, very interesting and exciting kind of aspect to bringing two channels together. You know, screens in malls and obviously measuring footfall, then an uplift going into store. There's an interesting dynamic creative case of that in the UK actually, where um, there was a, a kind of wait time on the screens uh, for the queue at the local store. So consumers walking past the screen in the mall could see if I pop into the local store, how long is the wait time? So again, a, a use of sort of dynamic creative alongside uh, retail media and mall, um, sorry, outdoor media as well. Um, many of the questions are quite duplicative actually. So I think we've, we've actually covered most of them. Um, if I've missed one, just looking through quickly, no, they're, they're mostly around uh, venue types. Uh, cross-channel and a little bit there about retail media. So thank you, everyone on the panel. Really appreciate your inputs. Very insightful as always. We thank you for giving up some of your time today. Uh, so please, a round of applause for the colleagues. Thank you.
All that remains to be said is thank you again. We really appreciate you coming along. Uh, hopefully you've had some, uh, seen some interesting data points. Obviously great uh, to see that the German market is very, very uh, buoyant in terms of outdoor and uh, programmatic outdoor. In many cases, it leads the way. Uh, it certainly leads the way in terms of looking at revenues, looking at things like programmatic guaranteed, looking at other topics. I think we've concluded today, though, there is a lot of potential, whether that is dynamic creative, whether that is uh, unlocking omnichannel budgets, um, data we've skirted around. We didn't talk too much about data, but I think we all believe that if we're really going to unlock major budgets in other channels, then data has to improve and that understanding of the audience behind the screens probably has to improve as well. Um, do grab one of our cubes. You can see them on screen there. Lovely video of how to, uh, how to action a cube. But um, do take a photo uh, of you uh, with that cube in a quirky part of your city or somewhere uh, around kind of the, your office. Uh, we'd love to get a little bit of noise on social media uh, about how uh, this event has um, hopefully encapsulated you, but also just uh, in terms of kind of these, these giveaways. Uh, there is a prize. I don't know what the prize is, actually. Is, there a, is it a good prize? I don't know. Amazing, amazing prize, I've been assured. So Incredible. it's an amazing prize. So, uh, so please do share. Um, do, of course, scan the QR code for the report. Do have a look at the global report if you have the chance. There's some really interesting data points uh, from other countries, as I said. Um, and all that remains to be seen is thank you again. Please hang around. We've got the venue for a little bit longer if you'd like to network, ask any of our panelists questions, or ask the VIEW team any questions. But again, from me and the rest of the VIEW team and from all of our panelists, thank you very much for coming along today. Thank you.